Hi, my name is Jim Amon, and welcome again to one of the uh, upcoming TV shows, uh, Then and Now. I am here today uh, talking about human trafficking. This is a third part in a four-part series. I'm very excited to have uh, two leaders in the legislature on this particular issue with us today. To my immediate right, uh, Representative Ritter, and to my far right, uh, Representative Ribimbus. Uh, so I want to just kind of open up talking again about human trafficking. Uh, what a lot of people don't know in Connecticut or around the United States that over 300,000 children are lured into this business every single year. It is not a problem that uh, exists outside of our borders. It's something that all of us should be aware of right here in Connecticut. I'm going to open it up to Representative Ritter uh, and then hopefully we'll have a great dialogue of what happened in the legislature this year when it comes to this, uh, comes to this particular issue. Uh, both uh, Representative Ritter and Representative Rubimbus were both leaders on this, and again, uh, uh, our children are safer because of their efforts. So welcome, uh, Representative Ritter, Rep uh, Representative Rubimbus, thank you so much for coming this morning. Um, again, why don't we start with you, uh, Representative Ritter, tell me um, what gave you the passion to start this issue up in the legislature this year? Sure. Thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk about something that I think we were very successful at uh, not only moving legislatively but widening the conversation certainly across the state of Connecticut uh, in a way that can help our families and our children be safer. So we're very, uh, very pleased at the result. And uh, in, some, in some respects, it was an interesting process that got us uh, to this uh, particular legislation. Um, the women in both the House and the Senate, Democrats and Republicans, at different times had been meeting over various issues, but a group of us thought that it would be of real benefit to the state if we could find something that we could all uh, work on together as a group, every one of us. And uh, several of us had heard from other legislatures um, across the country at various meetings that efforts to strengthen legislation state by state about the penalties for this type of trafficking um, had been initiated successfully in many states and we agreed as a group to take it on. And uh, it, the result was we had a piece of legislation that was introduced by every woman in the House and Senate both parties. Uh, it was an exciting but very interesting bipartisan effort and I let, think we were me, successful. Let me stop you there and then I, I you know that was it was very interesting because of course you know uh, being the former speaker and uh, traveling in the in the hallways obviously the women decided to have this press conference on their own uh, with women only and obviously uh, some people had something to say about that sure. but tell me what the motivation was why you did it that way. I certainly know now, and I'm very proud of what you did, but why don't you explain a little bit more about that, uh, Representative Rubindas. Absolutely, and once again, Mr. Speaker, I want to say thank you to you personally for bringing this topic to everyone's attention early on. Um, it's certainly a topic that we all wish that wasn't an issue that needed to be addressed, but unfortunately the reality is that it is. Um, as Representative Ritter had indicated, so as a women caucus, um, we were really trying to get behind a topic, a piece of legislation that we can all support. And then, of course, there was many different topics that came up, but I think it was natural when this topic came up, as soon as people started thinking a little bit about it, well, let's prioritize and see where we can make the biggest difference and biggest impact in the state of Connecticut. And for some of us, including myself, when I first heard the topic, certainly it's a topic very important, but how important is it to Connecticut? We self-educated ourselves that this is taking place right here in the state of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. As you had referenced the Berlin Turnpike um, earlier, and we had one of the largest federal cases. So it was very natural, once we identified that this is occurring here and needs to be addressed right away, then we all got together, all 55 female legislators in both chambers, both the House and the Senate. We got together, we certainly did also with the collaboration of the Permanent Commission on the Status of Women, got together and did this press conference because we thought early on it takes it takes obviously everyone to support this legislation and everyone's input in, or, in order to then have it passed. So we did identify that the best way to go about it is to get the word out, make people aware of the issue. Mm -hmm. um, and this would also allow them for the public hearing for us to get input and feedback so we can make sure that this isn't just a topic we want to talk about, but something we can actually put together, draft, that's going to make the maximum impact. 
Um, so we were all very proud in putting that together, and we actually did have several <laughs> men join our press conference as well. And again, um, we took kind of the um, forefront role in presenting it, and but again, it wasn't without the assistance of Representative Berger, Representative Fox, and many others who then helped us in the drafting of it and really getting it passed in, in the um, House. But we certainly, it's a piece of legislation we're all very much invested in. Um, the work is still not done, mm -hmm. so hopefully in the enforcement aspect, and we can really monitor it, and there is a task force that's going to be studying the statistics, mm -hmm. um, so we that have the hard facts to determine if this piece of legislation needs to be looked at, modified, um, strengthened. So moving forward, hopefully we will continue this effort, and I know that all of the women um, are certainly looking forward to continuing to be vested in this legislation. Uh, you know, everything you said makes so much sense, and I think uh, anybody that might be watching this or listening to what you have to say, um, when we develop legislation, obviously we're trying to get the facts, put something together that we hopefully is going to work. And But what's great, as we all know about legislation, there's an old saying, it's like making sausage and those sort of things. You never know what, what you get on one end, what's going to happen on the other side uh, when it's done. But the reality is that's true. Um, but you need to monitor it. it. It is a living, as we know, our Constitution is a living document, just like any piece of legislation is. So if, it, if it's working in some areas, we have to continue to invest in those areas. If it's not working, we need to, to, to redo it. Uh, and that's how we did with Megan's Law when it came back in Chisa. I'm going to age myself in 95 when I took on that, uh, that issue of Megan's Law um, here in the state. It took years, and then we were fought constitutionally. Right. We actually mm -hmm. we lost in the state Supreme Court. We finally won with uh, Attorney uh, General Blumenthal in, in the Supreme Court. Uh, so, for, but, uh, so we hope that you won't have as many problems as we had, though, now the law uh, is one of the best laws in the nation, mm -hmm. and then finally became national law. We hope the same thing uh, happens w with the legislation that you just recently passed. So I want to get more into that. I want to uh, kind of shake up and massage what we did. So uh, why don't we talk about uh, what exactly the legislation, I believe there were three pieces? It was, was it one, four? we ended one, up with that's one bill. Why, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. We put everything in one yes. big bill. So why don't we explain a little bit about that uh, Okay. What those what the bill does. It's I'll start, and I know Representative right, Bimis please. can help sure. me with. Yeah, please. I open that to you. Both, <laughs> of you. both of you. Her background and the fact also that uh, she is uh, ranking on the committee on judiciary yeah, awesome. is yes. what really, in my opinion, drove this bill. Um, it helped those three, perhaps a little more disparate pieces of legislation, right. come together into one in the committee on judiciary, as well as. Uh, get it uh, out of the committee and over the finish line. And that actually in our strategizing was an important part mm -hmm. of the process. Mm -hmm. I hate to make, make it just sound like a strategy type of thing, but um, obviously when we got together as a group, we were seeking, we wanted to be successful in our right. effort. Mm -hmm. And uh, having um, a representative or Mimbus in this position was a big contributor to having that happen. Mm -hmm. um, we started out uh, looking at the broad topic, really, of uh, trying to reduce or eliminate any economic incentives for anyone to want to engage in this kind of activity in Connecticut. And then that sort of started to take us into the specifics um, of the law and what we were going to have to do. We realized that in Connecticut we did not yet have the ability to uh, forfeit assets from people that engage in this type um, mm -hmm. of activity that benefit from trafficking uh, for purposes um, of prostitution, uh, partic most particularly involving a minor, mm -hmm. and so we worked on that. Um, and I think we had some good um, common efforts too. I, I, there is always some concern when you're talking about things like asset forfeiture, and, and you can help me when I go, <laughs> go off the deep end on this a little bit. You know, there is a, an, an element of due process that has to happen, sure. uh, and you know, we wanted to make sure that um, that it was. Um, oh, I hesitate to use the word even-handed because I'm not sure I might be inclined to be even-handed yeah, in this I, I, situation. I sure. But that it be a fair and legal process, I, and that people's mm -hmm. rights are guaranteed. Of course. So um, there was that. We also were concerned about um, the victims themselves, the legal process that uh, would then be available to victims themselves to have a presumption if for minors 
um, that if they were caught up in this kind of thing and ended up in court, that they would be able to um, successfully assert that indeed this was because they were trafficked um, and to make that differentiation and give them protections in the law. Um, and finally, as Representative Rabimbas talked about, the requirements um, that information come back to us uh, about not just the effectiveness of this legislation, but perhaps recommendations to further strengthen it um, or to, um, to maybe look in some other directions that can help us deal with our um, initial purpose. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And you might want to add to that. <laughs> sure. I think Representative Ritter did a wonderful job describing everything, and certainly our task was there was three individual bills out there. And I think it would have been very easy for us at that time to just pick any one of those, because all three are very meritous. Um, but what we really wanted to do is make the biggest impact possible. So we did try to consolidate it into one. So that in and of itself was a challenge, um, and only because we got so many women to co-sponsor the original bill early on that we also wanted to keep That's the right. integrity and the respect of the individuals that co-sponsored it, that we didn't change anything that may have That's made right. them not want to continue supporting mm -hmm. it. So there was a lot of uh, balancing um, going forward, but I'm very happy at the success of having to consolidate it, and certainly Representative Ritter highlighted the three most um, biggest components because again, we want to make sure that it has the biggest impact. So when you have this type of industry, criminal enterprise happening, whether it's in the state of Connecticut or across the United States, it's for the money. So unless we address that, unless we take out the financial um, impact that it has, I don't think we would be doing it justice. So again, just simply throwing someone behind bars, spending time in prison, but really not getting to the heart of it because it's the financial gain that they have, um, these obviously the pimps. Um, we need to address that, and that's was certainly what we did. So that's where the asset forfeiture comes. And again, there's a process when it comes to that. but. That, I believe, is one of the most important things. And then the other thing is, rightfully so, we have victims who are now survivors of this industry. And so now we need to empower them, and we need to allow them an ability, a process, where they can vacate any convictions that they previously had. Because the way the laws were written, they would actually have to be convicted as prostitutes. And once you're convicted as a prostitute, in order to have a felony charge, to go out there, start a new life, find a job, get a loan, whatever the case is, they always have that over their heads. So as true victims, in the legislation we passed, there's a process to vacate the conviction. Again, it's not simply just someone alleging that they're a victim, there is a criteria, and I do believe that it's a very good criteria. Um, but what that will allow is then a victim to be able to apply in the court system to vacate that so then they could start their new lives, so that they could find a job. Because the worst thing we can do is for these victims who are now survivors to have no other, you know, a more narrow means of job possibilities out there sure. that might inadvertently push them back Correct. into the right. industry, Correct. So continuing that. And we don't want that, so we do want to make sure that we empower um, the survivors of this type of uh, incident. So all of those were components that we studied, we researched, and hopefully um, it's going to be properly addressed in this bill. But again, with the task force, which we did make some changes to the task force, to make sure that we have everyone that has the background, education, um, experience serving in that task force, that then can come back and let us know how this piece of legislation is being utilized, if it's actually being enforced, mm -hmm. um, as well as what the statistics are. So then we truly know if it's having a positive impact or if we need to go back to the drawing board um, and, and make any changes that might be necessary in that regard. So all that, I believe, is very important. The asset forfeiture as well, those funds are going to go back into the victim's fund. So that will allow for additional resources w for those victims and, again, for educational purposes, training, um, because, again, having the laws out there but not having the awareness and training and education behind it, then, unfortunately, we're not doing the, you know, the jobs that we really should be doing and having the impact we should have. No, you're absolutely right, and I think it is very important for people to understand that uh, many, well, all of these uh, young women and young mm -hmm. men um, are victimized, and the worst thing we can continue to do is re-victimize them, or um, because right. of, of also uh, the stigma, but the emotional uh, part of this uh, on the individual, and the hold that 
uh, the former pimps right. or gangs have on these particular individuals. Very hard to explain to someone that doesn't really understand it. But you're right. If you come, come out of this uh, particular industry and try to redo your life, restart mm -hmm. your life, um, and then the people that basically helped you are now right, turning yeah. their back on you or giving the same stigma, you're right, they're just going to go back to the, you know, whether they were on drugs or alcohol or homeless or whatever right. the other things that happened in their life to got it, that happened to them and was easy prey for these uh, these uh, pimps to go after. One we of need the, to make sure that we One of the more compelling do that. So I love that part of the bill, so thank you. Uh, well, to that point, um, and I would really encourage um, anybody that that for, finds this topic um, compelling to understand that you you can read the stories how people are lured, particularly our young people, lured into this uh, type of activity and understand one of the most shocking statistics, 80% of young people that leave home are approached within 48 hours yeah, to yeah, engage amazing. in this kind of, I mean, that's, it's, it's a horrifying statistic, and it's chilling because it outlines the, the, the very calcula calculating um, ac activities that go on the part of the perpetrators, but also, um, I mean, 80 percent is, is a very overwhelming number, and particularly when you're talking for young people, it's devastating. But then to follow what happens to them later as they try to put their lives back together, mm -hmm. as you sure. both spoke to, is um, it's just very, very compelling reading, very sad reading, and if it doesn't move uh, the ordinary person to action, <laughs> that would well, be you know, surprising. We all have that attitude, never, never my child, it would never happen to me. Right. I'm too protective, I'm too this, I'm too that. It happens, we know there's no discrimination, sure. rich, poor, smart, uh, you know, mm -hmm. dropouts, whatever it is, it, they're, they're prey for these individuals and, and they know how to pick them out and oh. they know how to yes. get them right away, which is really, really scary. Absolutely, and I would actually add, because we've been talking how the legislation happened, I mean, we truly just did our jobs as legislators. That's what we should be doing. But the people that really should be commended are the victims, the survivors that were able to come out and testify. I mean, we heard from Marie. That was right. very compelling. That's um, a lot of credit to her. Also, Ray Bouchard, um, who wrote the book, yes. Yes. Uh, Berlin Turnpike, again, telling the story. Um, a story that many of us hadn't heard in the state of Connecticut. So their ability, and then Mr. Speaker, again, credit to you to having brought this topic to light several years ago already. Um, you are, are all truly worth commending for doing that because, again, we just did our job as legislators, but without the people telling us the stories, getting it out there, um, we wouldn't have known any better. And again, the statistics, just since 2008 when DCF has first started looking at this, they actually positively identified 100 children in the DCF system right here in the state of Connecticut. That's shocking, and those are real statistics. Um, so it was, you know, very important and a very compelling thing, and hopefully it's just, you know, once again, we're just getting started in this. So gathering the facts and moving forward, I think, will be very important. Let me add to your, your thoughts there, and uh, Representative Ritter, we just talked about earlier before the show started, that there was a recent incident that just happened here in Connecticut. Yes. Can you uh, talk a little bit about that? Um, and this was, I believe, the largest or one of the largest yes. coordinated federal activities in Connecticut. And, and as you ask me the question, I'll forget the numbers, but That's it's okay. my understanding that um, five victims um, yes. that were um, immediately positively identified, one I, at least, I believe, from your part yes. of Connecticut and several from mine, yes. uh, which was very, uh, very sad. It, the level of organization that was uncovered in the, in this was very um, really distressing to people that perhaps are spending their time doing their best raising their families and doing the best for their kids to understand that um, I think I think there's going to be a lot more um, interesting information from all of us to hopefully digest and and perhaps try to, to push back um, to educate and understand how um, easy it is for all of our children uh, to be victimized in this way without our knowing as parents. Mm -hmm. And to add to that, going back to Mr. Speaker, when you said that you know people think not my child, mm -hmm. if right. you have children on <coughs> Facebook 
if you have right. children Thank surfing yes. online, yes. Um, any one of those children could be susceptible to having, unfortunately, those contacts with the wrong people in that regard. Again, we did talk about um, the most vulnerable children, those in the DCF system, foster care system, and but then there's runaways. There's children that are kidnapped. And I think probably not any one of us uh, doesn't know a story of someone who was kidnapped or has been in foster care um, or has had you know troubles, but it's not just from that. If again, you could be from a very well-off upper-class family, be on Facebook and unfortunately be lured in a way that may lead to something along these lines. So again, it's something that I think uh, the education component is very important, the awareness component, but every parent and guardian out there mm -hmm. really should be aware of how these perpetrators are reaching children, again, mm -hmm. whether male or female, and even some young adults, unfortunately. And I gotta, I gotta add to that because I think all of us, you know, as, as parents or guardians or whatever, you know, we wanna respect our, our young people and their privacy but you can only do it to a point. It is so important that I'd rather have a parent be nosy and a pain in the butt <laughs> or aggressive and get your child mad at you than to have your child end up uh, being a human oh. trafficking victim. So I encourage parents, I encourage you as legislators to go out to the schools and to educate as part of the curriculum of how easy it is to get a child uh, alert into this industry, but how like a pizza you can be ordered within minutes off of Facebook. And when I told people that, when I first saw it, yeah. when somebody approached me and showed me how I, could, I didn't believe them, mm -hmm. I said, whoa, whoa, Craigslist, and they said, whoa, whoa, Twitter, oh, yeah. any social media, it's sure. there, and you can buy it just like a pizza. I said, don't even tell me that. And then within five minutes on Facebook, I, I, was, I was stunned. I brought that to uh, the judiciary chair who has two small children. Yes. He was more stunned than me. Sure. And he goes, oh my God. I said, so th I said, think about that, Mr. Chairman. There are guys out there buying these kids like you would buy a sandwich, mm -hmm. okay? You need to educate people to show you how easy it is, uh, and it's so dangerous. Um, so let's get to an, an, a little, hopefully a little lighter <laughs> note. Um, what I really enjoyed about this is the bipartisanship. Uh, as speaker and as a legislator over the years, uh, most people think Democrats and Republicans really don't like each other, <laughs> and certainly with Washington, what's going on down there, um, it is horrible. I've had opportunities to actually uh, go down there, and, as I yes. saw uh, Representative Ritter, but um, lobby down there sometimes, my, and if I tell them I'm a Democrat or Republican, it's like they walk away, <laughs> and if I'm a Democrat, I'm embraced, but it's so silly. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, 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 a, I'm a former now, okay? Um, but this attitude down there of division and just because you have this label that you shouldn't work together. Uh, my experience has always been, no. The best legislation is when we sit down, we are supposed to compromise. And I know sometimes nowadays politically that's a bad word, but it's not. It's how our forefathers wanted it to work. So talk a little bit about this wonderful bipartisan ship that you developed on this <laughs> issue. And hopefully it will continue to grow. And sometimes I've found out that, you know, Geez, I had such a different impression of that individual mm -hmm. on the other side of the aisle until I sat down with them and actually had a conversation. And then a lot of them end up being pretty close friends sure, of mine. So sure. why don't we have a conversation about that? A, a couple things, I guess that, I guess maybe I'll start and you can interrupt me, please feel free. <laughs> um, I think that um, when we first sat around <clears throat> and started thinking about it, maybe I'll speak from my perspective. <laughs> that might be easier. <laughs> Um, one of the things we did, we took a little inventory, but you know, because one of the things that's important to understand is where your opportunities are for being effective. And um, we were um, happy, I think, to identify what we thought was a good opportunity to have Representative Rabimba sitting where she does sit on the Committee on Judiciary. That was important. Um, and I think also important to some of us, I might be one of them. I'm. I'm pretty sure Representative Rabimbus might be one of us too that think that that the influence of women in leadership positions in a lot of our committees um, is something we, we'd perhaps like to see more of. And uh, so that maybe mm -hmm. started a little bit for us. Sure, and Do I absolutely wanna? agree with Representative Ritter in that regard. And I think that's where we saw the strength of having a women's caucus 
um, and the ability to brainstorm as to what was the topic that we would want to champion and move forward on. And I could honestly say, um, in this piece of legislation, I would have it no other way but have it in a bipartisan way. Um, quite frankly, I guess I'll be the uh, poster child and campaign person for, I think, all most legislation, um, if not all legislation, and I'm just being realistic in that regard, really should be done in the bipartisan way. I think some of the most successful um, legislations we've had come out of the Capitol has been something that's been done in a bipartisan way. Um, so this one was absolutely appropriate in that regard, and we just have to think about it. That means everyone early on mm -hmm. and throughout the that's process right. is vested informed That's and right. is making a difference. So then again, that investment hopefully will lead to the success of having it pass. I'm always shocked when people propose legislation that they don't reach out <laughs> to the people on the other side of the aisle. Or even, yep. you know, more naively on my part early on, to the people that are most interested in the topic. So the organizations that it's going to impact, the people that it's going to impact. I think having those conversations, doing your research, and involving people early on, and in this particular mm -hmm. case going to the topic of a bipartisanship, should be a requirement if you want something that's going to be a good, successful piece of legislation coming out. So certainly in this regard, it was, I believe, a successful one. I certainly hope it's one of many more in the coming mm -hmm. future here, um, but it's one that I'm very proud that it was done in a bipartisan way. Well, and I, I, I just add one thing. I think that we will, we certainly hope um, that we've laid the groundwork to maybe have a more permanent platform to do some more in the future um, in this manner. And I think that, um, you know, there are issues that many people think are the traditional women's issues or this or this or that, and then there are other issues that maybe aren't always thought of that way. Uh, whereas in, in this case, we crossed some of those those lines, mm -hmm. and I think that was um, to our benefit and hopefully effective and puts us in a strong position to continue to do some good work. Well, and we really, really did a great job together, and uh, I was very, very happy uh, to see many people taking the torch on this and, and taking that leadership role, and I hope that continues. I just want to um, express a little concern that I have. Uh, you may or may not agree with it, so p please, uh, you have the right of your opinion, that's why you're on the show. Uh, but, um, I, and correct me if I'm wrong too, but, but I, I read something recently uh, about the Permanent uh, Commission on, on Women, I believe it was, uh, being there concerned about the John and the stigma on the family. I'm going to give you my opinion that I'd like to hear yours on it. Of course I feel horrible for any family and the, embarrass the embarrassment of that. Uh, but if the victim has to be put through that, they have family too. So the John should be um, treated exactly the same way, in my personal opinion. Uh, I had the same issue way back when with Megan's Law, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. I had a uh, group come in uh, from mm -hmm. uh, the Permanent Commission, um, and we sat down, and they were concerned uh, about um, uh, statutory rape, which I, I listened. They also were concerned uh, uh, about some other issues dealing with the perpetrator. And I, I didn't understand it then, and I guess I don't understand it now. Uh, so I hope that we understand that um, Johns that prey on young women under the age of 18 should not be treated any different than that victim. In fact, I understand there are laws against people having sex with underage kids, mm -hmm. uh, and we should treat them Correct. with the strongest uh, part of the law and hopefully send some strong messages to these individuals. But I'd love to hear your opinion on that. Sure. I actually did not read the article, um, and I like to believe that I'm sensitive to everyone that's involved, but I certainly take the same position as you just mentioned. Um, quite frankly, it's an illegal act. So if you're going to be paying someone for sex, that's Correct. illegal. Correct. If you're going to force, coerce, or fraudulently lure someone into an action against their will and for profit, that's illegal. Um, so then if you're convicted and tried and convicted or certainly pled guilty to something and then you're labeled um, and potentially even have now a felony charge, you did something, something illegal. Um, so I guess I don't 
appreciate so much, you know, the stigma on someone who actually did an illegal act. Um, again, laws are to protect our most vulnerable. So those are people under age um, that are being forced to do things, but it's an illegal act. Don't do it, Correct. and you won't have the stigma. I think there there was a little bit of discussion at different times ar on around that, and I, I think that uh, it was pretty clear that the opinion lies, as Representative Rabindus outlined it. Um, whether this continues to be a topic or not, um, you know, I can't uh, predict with, with any accuracy. I think that in light of a lot of the things that we've learned pertinent to this bill and the type of um, actions that, that are increasingly becoming uh, pred predatory actions against our young people, it's very difficult for me to understand how um, perhaps that opinion might change. Well, I'm very, very glad to hear that. <laughs> um, I um, first of all, I appreciate your efforts uh, on this particular legislation. It is close to my heart, and uh, uh, we, as we, as we know, as legislators, we never know really ever uh, how our laws or our uh, movements uh, uh, to fight for people really works, and we'll maybe never really know the results of that. Uh, but that's not what the, why they put us in office. So if we stopped one perpetrator, if we stopped one kid for falling victim. You've all done a tremendous job, and you should be proud of what you're doing. I'm very proud of the legislature. I'm proud of the bipartisanship, uh, and I want you to continue to do that. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping that next year, uh, as, as you look at this particular committee, uh, again, uh, make the law strong, continue to fight for these kids, and, and I'd really appreciate that. Uh, we're going to close by saying that this is the th third of a four-part series. Uh, really enjoyed our guests today, uh, Representative Ritter and Representative Rabimbus. Uh, also, uh, we'll be uh, again having our show coming up for the final part of the series uh, with uh, a victim of human trafficking, maybe two, uh, to have their stories told. Uh, we're looking forward to that, and hopefully, it will be uh, one that many will uh, look at and uh, and learn from. We are also going to be uh, on a on a show coming up talking about our 13-part uh, TV series on human trafficking based on the book Berlin Turnpike and other cases in the Northeast, uh, including one right here uh, that was a national case, mm -hmm. and then unfortunately just recently, which involved uh, this individual's brother uh, and wife who happened to be a state trooper. So we'll get into that a little bit more in a couple of shows from now. I uh, thank you and our guests one more time for being here and to listening to us. And uh, we'll see you next time on Then and Now.
Christmas card. 